Sonos describes their One SL small speaker as having room filling sound. And then Harman Kardon make a Sonos like speaker called the Citation One. Again, it's like a pint sized speaker. And guess how Harman describe its performance? Yes, they say it has room filling sound, even though it's only this big. And then Logitech have a pair of Bluetooth speakers, a stereo pair called the, the Z207 or Z207. And they're tiny. And yet Logitech describe them as having room filling sound. This video is brought to you by Rune 2.0, the revolutionary music player designed for true music fanatics. Click to runelabs.com for more information. Welcome back everybody. In today's video, I want to ask and hopefully answer, are two subwoofers better than one? And to help me answer that question is the Golden Ear Force Field 30 subwoofer, which was launched in Munich last year. In fact, obviously to answer this question, Golden Ear have sent me two of those subwoofers. Now the Golden Ear Force Field 30 isn't really what you would call a micro subwoofer, although you might call it small, in that its front facing driver measures eight inches across. And it is kind of ported, although it's not a port, it's a downward firing passive radiator, obviously on the bottom of the unit that sort of augments the base output of the, the entire box. And that measures nine inches by 11 inches. And the whole thing is powered by a 1000 watt digital amplifier. And Golden Ear themselves rate the in-room performance or output of this subwoofer as being good all the way down to 25 Hertz. I had originally planned to make this video applying the Golden Ear subs to the Zoo Soul 6, but I featured those Zoos in the last four or five videos and I'm sure you wanna see something different, right? And besides, that something different should really be a stand mount loudspeaker because I think most people are adding subs to stand mounts. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have the foresight to bring the Golden Ear BRX two-way stand mount with me to Lisbon. So instead, I have to reach for the Lumina 2 made by Sonus Faber that you can see behind me as my stand mount of choice for this video. They're a compact two-way. And I did measure their performance in this room as heard at the listening position, which is over here. And I used the Umic One microphone and Room EQ Wizard to see what's going on with the Lumina 2 running completely solo in this room as driven by an NAD M10 V2. And I've got those measurements on my tablet just here. So if we look at this graph, we can see, first of all, as described in my review of the Lumina 2, that they have a bit of a kick in the, in the lower treble. So they make music sound very exciting. But you can also see that despite a sort of 60 Hertz bump that I think has been deliberately designed into these loudspeakers, certainly their in-room response, to give them a better sense of bass, that below around 40 Hertz, they really just start to fall off, but they fall off really nicely, really smoothly. So below 40 Hertz, we're not really getting a lot of bass, which is why we would add a subwoofer because that bass roll off is completely immaterial to music like the Mountain Goats' Bleed Out album, which is bloody excellent and super exciting. And the lyrical content was based upon, I think, action movies. So it's a bit weird lyrically. I love it. However, if I cut over to something like Trace by Rhythm and Sound, the Lumina 2 are excellent at communicating the spaciousness of that track because of that sort of tweeter zing, if you like. But the intermittent bass rumble or bass throbs that kind of percolate that track is mostly missing in action. So that really is what these measurements mean for the music that we listen to through these loudspeakers. So I put one Force Field 30 subwoofer between the loudspeakers on the rug right in front of my IKEA Kallax unit and connect it to the M10 V2 using an AudioQuest Greyhound cable. Now I chose this cable not because of any sound quality issues, but mainly because it's thin and it's light and it's easy for me to manage, especially when I'm managing long runs as I am here at times. And the NAD M10 V2 also has 
its own bass management system. So that means that the amplifier high passes what goes out to the loudspeakers and low passes what goes out to the sub, which therefore means we have to engage the LFE mode on the back of the gold near subwoofer. And then obviously we have to adjust the gain level, so the volume level of the subwoofer ourselves in order to blend it in with the loudspeakers by ear. This is what audio files like to do, isn't it? Blend it in, synergy. Synergy. But if your amplifier doesn't manage the subwoofer crossover point for you, not to worry. You can just connect it as before, but then you have to flip the switch on the back of the gold near sub into what's marked as left right mode, and then you use the nearby rotary to set the crossover point. Let's take a small musical diversion because I want to tell you which tracks, which music tracks, I use to dial in the gold near sub between the Sonus Faber loudspeakers. So the first one was Trent Moller's Vamp. The second one was Massive Attack's Angel. The third one was Mango Drive by Rhythm and Sound. That whole album is an amazing dub album. It's fantastic. And then I also use Little Fluffy Clouds by The Orb, but not the normal album studio version, the live album version from 1993. I think the album's called Live Orb 93 or Evil Bro 93, the green cover. And then lastly, to really listen to how organic the bass sounds, I usually pull up Peter Gabriel's Mercy Street. But if you've got a favorite track or tracks that you like to use to dial in a subwoofer, then please let us know what they are in the comment section below. However, nowadays I don't just use my ear to dial in a subwoofer's, I guess the gain level is what I'm setting in my room because the amp is doing the crossover. But I also use the Umic One microphone and Room EQ Wizard. And I took a measurement again. I started with an 80 hertz crossover because I think that's the standard crossover point for most audio systems. And I just adjusted the gain on the back of the sub and the graph that's on the screen now, you can see that in red, that's the Lumina 2's response without the subwoofer, so kind of like what we saw before. And then the green is the after, after we've added the sub, and that shows what we get with the subwoofer. Now you can see we get better extended bass, so it goes all the way down to, yep, 25 hertz, but we do have a bit of a dip at 30 and 40 hertz. So there's still some work to be done there. But to my ears, that 80 hertz crossover point didn't really sound quite right. And the graph shows us there's that dip there. So what I did is I moved the crossover point to 60 hertz, did some more listening and thought, yeah, that's a bit better. And then I took another measurement. And so now we've got a graph showing us what the frequency response of the speakers and the sub looks like with a 60 hertz crossover in blue and an 80 hertz crossover, what we had before, in green. It's a small difference. I think it's slightly better looking with the 60 hertz crossover, but that really belies what we hear in the seat because I think the 60 hertz crossover sounded better than the graph suggests. And what I mean by that is that we get deeper bass, yes, but it also makes the bass sound like it's coming from the loudspeakers themselves, which of course is preposterous, but that's the illusion of audio playback when done right, I think. And it also, the subwoofer that is, adds greater weight to the soundstage so that we feel like there's more heft coming towards us. It's not just about deeper bass reach, but a, a heavier sound. Now I said before that I could have messed around with the gain of the subwoofer a little bit more in, in better dialing it in to the measurement position, also the audible position, the optimal audible position, but I didn't. And the reason why not is quite simple. It's to do with the fact that this room is a thoroughfare to upstairs and downstairs. So a subwoofer cannot sit in the middle of the floor because accidents will 100% happen. So I moved the, the Gold Near Force Field 30 to the outside of the, the left-hand Sonus Faber loudspeaker. Now for me, it's much more out of the way. It looks better there, but I wondered, did it sound better and did it measure better? And the answer to those questions are both an emphatic yes. From an audible perspective, 
the bass sounded fuller and more voluptuous. And then again, I took a room EQ wizard measurement of the subwoofer at the side position and it measured much more nicely, much more nicely, much nicer as well. And on the screen right now, you can see another graph. I've got a pink line and a blue line. And you can see that with the crossover on the amp set to 60 Hertz, the blue line shows us the frequency response of the sub and the speakers with the sub in the middle of the, in the middle of the rug really between the loudspeakers. And the pink line shows the 60 Hertz crossover setting, but with the sub placed closer to the wall, but off to one side. And you can see, yeah, there's a bit of a lift at around 45 Hertz, but generally it's altogether smoother. And there isn't that sort of big sort of dip at 40 Hertz. So for me, it sounded better and it measured better off to one side. But what's really interesting about this side position is that there was more of an audible and measurable difference between the 80 Hertz crossover setting and the 60 Hertz crossover setting. So what you're looking at now, you can see the 60 Hertz crossover setting in pink and the 80 Hertz in orange. And you can see there's a dip at around 60 or 70 Hertz when the crossover is set at 80 Hertz. So basically I preferred the crossover point a little bit lower than we would normally put it. So we were hearing more of the speaker and slightly less of the subwoofer. It gave us a smoother response on the graph and it sounded better with the tracks that I mentioned earlier. But what doesn't show up in our Room EQ Wizard measurement graphs are that when you add a sub like this to a pair of essentially two-way monitor satellite loudspeakers, you get, for whatever reason I don't know, a better sense of music's spaciousness. The spatial cues seem to be much more abundant. Music sounds a bit bigger and you can sort of see, the, yeah, see the gaps between the sounds more easily, if I'm going to put it crudely like that. But there was a slight downside to it being off the left in that, and maybe this was just a psychological effect, I don't know, but it did seem to me ever so slightly, and I mean ever so slightly, that the bass was sort of emanating from the left-hand side of the room. But of course, as this video's title suggests, and as my intro suggests, I put that first Golden Ear Force Field 30 off to one side for a second reason. And that was because I wanted to put another one, a second Golden Ear Force Field 30, to the outside of the right-hand loudspeaker. And with the NAD amplifier offering twin sub outputs, I had proper stereo bass. But I found that I had to dial down the gain of each sub just a little bit to sort of make it sound altogether more in line with what I had before, because otherwise the bass just sounded a little bit too prominent. So how does it sound with the second subwoofer in play? Well, I gotta say it sounded unbelievably good. And it's not just that we get more bass or deeper bass, especially deeper bass. It's that the bass had a slightly improved textural quality. In that it sounded richer and smoother. And to me, yeah, I was going backwards and forwards in the Blue Sound app, because you can do this. So they have to adjust the gain a little bit each time you do it on the subs. I was going backwards and forwards and I heard that, yeah, with one sub, it just sounded a bit lumpier, like there was more boop in, in the subwoofer output. Whereas when I was using two subs, yeah, I didn't get that boop sound. It just sounded a lot smoother and less, less obvious, really. More integrated. Yeah, I, I think the word is richer. I really do think that is the right word here. But I do have some measurement graphs for you as well as taken with Room EQ Wizard at the listening position. And on the screen now, you can see we've got two lines, a pink one and a blue one. And the pink one is what we saw before, and that's the, the subwoofer output and the loudspeaker output combined with a crossover of 60 Hertz. That was my preferred, yeah, my preferred crossover point really in terms of measurements and in terms of what I heard. But then adding the second sub and then dialing the gain on each sub down a little bit, I took another measurement and you can see here we've got the blue line showing what the two subs with the loudspeakers looks like. Now you can see that 
above around, what is this, 100 hertz, it's identical pretty much. But below 100 hertz, it's not. So it's interesting, isn't it, how, and I should have mentioned this before actually, how the frequency response changes above our crossover point. Now, I would say that the, the pink line is a little bit lumpier and the blue line is a little bit smoother. There are some bumps along the way, but I also think that the base is a little bit better extended with the two subs. You can see that with the blue line at 30 hertz, it's a bit higher. And yeah, I think from a measurement point of view, correct me if you think I'm wrong, because this is the first time I've done this. So I'm learning as I go. So I'm just sharing my progress with you guys and girls. If you think that the subwoofer output from two subs doesn't look as good on paper as one sub, well, I would love to hear or love to know why, but certainly from my point of view, listening in the seat, I definitely prefer the sound of the two subs. And just for kicks, I thought I would do the measurable differences between one sub and two sub, but with the crossover set back to 80 hertz, where I didn't like it as much. And you can see again, so two subs is in brown, one sub is in orange. You can see even with the two subs, we do get, I think, a smoother response between 30 and 50, 60, 70. You can see with one sub, the orange line, it sort of dips a little bit at around 60 hertz, which I don't think is a, a real deal breaker. I mean, these differences are small, but again, I prefer the sound of two subs in the room as opposed to one, even though the crossover point wasn't in my personal optimal position. But what these measurements don't show is that listening in the seat, again, the second sub gives us a slightly better sense once again of music's inner spaciousness. It sounds bigger and a little bit bolder. But for me, I would say that with two subs in play, it sounds more like the whole room is playing the music, like we're cocooned in this sort of hemispheric shell of music. It sounds really bloody fantastic, actually. Now that, for me, is what I call room-filling sound. But the last graph I'll show you is this one, and it's basically the same graph as the last one without the one sub line on it. So this is essentially what I ended up with. This is two subs in the room augmenting the Lumina 2 from Sonus Faber to Golden Ear Force Field 30 subs and the crossover set at 60 hertz inside the NAD M10 V2. And I think it looks reasonably smooth. Yes, you can still see the kick up in the treble in the, in the right hand side of the graph. And maybe you could argue that the, the bass could be a bit smoother below 80 or 90 hertz, but it's beyond my technical capabilities from my understanding so far of how you would make that smoother. Maybe you'd need DSP to do it. I don't know. But the thing is, you have to be very careful about not getting too obsessed with the, the smoothness of your graph because Last year, we reviewed a micro subwoofer from SVS, and it has a parametric EQ built in, so you can adjust the output of the sub. And one day, just for a laugh, what I did for my own satisfaction was I adjusted the sub's parametric EQ so that my room EQ wizard measurement was super flat, and it was super flat, but it sounded absolutely awful. It sounded lumpy. So I think the measurement that I've got here in the listening seat from the Lumina 2 loudspeakers and the two golden ear subs, I think it looks pretty damn good and it sounds bloody amazing. Now, obviously, these results are specific to this room and I've got no idea how this would play out in your room or with different hardware. This is just Sonus Faber loudspeakers, golden ear subwoofers, and that is it. My aim today was merely to share my experiences in dialing one subwoofer in and then dialing a second and then looking at the differences. And I'm not for a moment suggesting that you should run out and buy two subwoofers. But if you're running a pair of two-way stand mounts as I am here, and you're kind of thinking, oh, I wish I had better sound quality, what's my next upgrade? And you're looking at a new amplifier or you're looking at a new DAC, I would say, hang on a minute. Because if you don't have a sub, and your domestic situation can accommodate a sub. As per my video on this topic from last year, 
please put down the DAC and amplifier brochure and go and look at subs because they will bring much more to the party if you're running two-way stand mount loudspeakers than changing up your amp or changing up your DAC or changing up your phono stage or anything like that. The sub really for me comes after the speakers and the room in terms of the hierarchy of what has the most dramatic effect on what you hear in the listening position, in my case over here. So we come back to the original question. Are two subwoofers better than one? Well, I guess in my case with my hardware here and this room, I would say yes, but it's not a night and day difference. Two subs don't blow one sub out of the water. Two subs don't destroy one sub. None of that nonsensical hyperbole, please. No, it's a small difference. And I think really, if you're a pragmatist, and we covered this last week, didn't we? If you're a pragmatist, I think having one sub is where the big gains are. And that's probably where you should stay if you're a pragmatist. But if you're an idealist or you're somebody who wants to improve the sound of the bass in your room, then I think you should look at having a second subwoofer. One more thing. There are good scientific reasons as to why two subs are better than one. I haven't covered them in this video, mainly because I don't understand them well enough to explain them here. But the basics of it from the research that I've done so far tell me that essentially having two subwoofers sort of minimizes the influence of the room on the base. But that's as far as I've got. There are plenty of resources on the net. I'll try and share with you in the description box below some of the, the videos and the websites that I've found that helped improve a little bit my understanding of why two subs theoretically, theoretically could be better than one. But I'll repeat it again. This was an experiential video. This is me sharing my experiences with both measured results and I guess my well, yeah, what I heard in the listening seat. But I would not call those objective and subjective. Why not? Well, because there is subjective in the objective. In that, I had to choose which microphone, which software, but more importantly, I had to choose where to place the microphone. And that is actually level with the gap between the top of the couch and the bottom of the acoustic panels. But then again, it's the whole room that's been treated, not just that strip behind one's head. It's the whole room effect. But if I move the microphone six inches, and I showed this in a video about, about a month ago, if you move the microphone six inches, you can get a fairly different measurement. And that's what I call the subjective choices inside the objective. And then at the other end, once the measurements come out of Room EQ Wizard, I have to interpret them. Now I did my best here to say which ones I thought were better than the others. I might have got it wrong. And that's the point, isn't it? Because interpreting graphs is a subjective process. And again, that's another example of where there is subjectivity inside the objective process, which is why I don't personally call measurements objective data because they have, you know, subjectivity feeding into them. Anyway, I hope you like this video. I'm sorry for the little ranty bit at the end. I hope you found this video informative. If you did, please consider liking this video down below. If you like my attitude towards hi-fi, bass, the room, subwoofers, one subwoofer, two subwoofers, and also covering a product in a way that's not just a straight up review with a side-by-side -side comparison to another product. I know some of you will have wanted that, but I didn't do that today because I wanted to investigate if two subwoofers would sound better than one and by what kind of margin. It was a noticeable margin, but it's not night and day. So please bear that in mind when, I guess, interpreting this video because it, yeah, it was a, a smallish kind of difference. Anyway, I'm rambling again. If you dig all of that, then please consider subscribing to this channel. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching. So I put one force field 30 right on the rug in the middle, no, in a spaciousness that I spoke of before, but I forgot what I was gonna say.